everybody. It is John. It is Heavy Things Lightly. I just got off the telewebs with Sister Anastasia, who wrote the book You Are Mine. I highly recommend. Wow, we talked about the occult. She was deeply involved in, I don't know, paganism with the spirits of the old world. And we get into it. We talk about how it's related to what we call West African juju. We talk about how it's related to modern capitalism. She's brilliant and you'll love this conversation. Sister Anastasia and I talking about her new book, You Are Mine, St. Vladimir's Press. We got all the links, check it out. Also, Art of Tomada. That's when we go and we do deep dive on the sea anthropology of hospitality. Guest speakers of this year include Jordan Hall, Vesper Stamper, Richard Rowland, a guest, a guest speaker, a secret one. That just means we haven't finalized yet, but you'll like it. Uh, two of them this year, July 7 through 10. November 7 through 10. One out in Seattle area in Leavenworth at a beautiful resort. The other back down in the Keys at a beautiful resort, Pines and Palms. That's in Florida, Sleeping Lady Resort in Washington. There's lots of different pricing on it. We'll try to figure it out. It's complicated, but it's fun. It's fun to think how you can spend your money while helping a nonprofit and also enjoying all kinds of activities, hiking, hookah, hookahing, supraing, and learning the art of the Tamara and doing it with lots of cool people. But not that many. 25. It's an intimate setting. It costs some dollars, but these good dollars. Good, well-spent dollars. Ask people about it who went last year. They loved it. This is Heavy Things Lightly. This is Sister Anastasia, the author of You Are Mine. Check it out. Sister Anastasia, how are you? It's nice to have you. Um, I'm just thankful. What, what, what's going on? Always, and my, the guys who follow the podcast know. Is there something really important in the world? A conversation about something old that you kind of are the embodiment of, as you sit there as a nun with us. But you're a new world person. Like you live and I live post enlightenment. So mm-hmm. you got a great story to tell. I'm really thankful to have you here. We just tell Thank folks you. you're an author. How did you stumble into being an author of this great book, You Are Mine? How, how did this happen? Well, it's a good way of putting it because it kind of was a stumbling, although retrospectively, I see it was a plan that was laid out for me, um, of which I wasn't aware of prior to it taking place. But the way that the book came into being is I had a very unexpected experience of um, an encounter with the living God, Jesus Christ, which was not in my plan or my view at all. I was in a very different world, uh, different spiritual world, different cultural world. Nothing in my world apart from my parents and their life and my background having been brought up Christian, evangelical Christian, and my younger sister's life as an Orthodox nun had any connection with Christianity. I was um, a practicing Buddhist and I was living and working in a kind of pagan counterculture, subculture, big universe that was completely disconnected from anything with Christ. And so I, um, but I happened to go on the invitation of my sister's spiritual father, who then had sort of become my spiritual father, but it was like at the early stages of that, because I was open to many different people, different kinds of spiritual teachers just didn't think of that being something exclusive to Christianity. And I'd met him and had an amazing Uh, meeting with him so on his invitation I went to the monastery uh, for my little sister and had this encounter with Christ and converted immediately to Christianity to orthodoxy and spent the next uh, period afterwards um, going back and forth to the monastery and just completely cutting off from my life as it had been beforehand and having this 
huge internal transformation that then resulted in my baptism. And at the end of that period, I returned to where I was from, which is England. And I decided to write down what had happened, um, primarily for those in my world, in the new age, in pagan religions, in it's in the book, it's called the medicine world, but it was the world of, yeah, I guess you could call it neo-paganism, but just say paganism in terms mm -hmm. of old elemental uh, practices and lineages to do, that involve witchcraft and sorcery, but we didn't talk about it in that way. It was just spirituality. And so I wrote uh, the book, which I didn't, start up as a book I just said I'm going to write my testimony like thinking it'd be a few pages um in order to tell them what what I'd found out basically so that they could and you were writing get free in the monastery you were writing as a monastic I, at that point I was no I was I was not a monastic I was I just converted to Christianity I was just a laywoman my sister uh, was a nun is a nun and I was writing after spending six months being in the monastery as a guest or ah, a so it was like a novice okay and then but i wasn't i wasn't yeah yes in a way i i immediately entered into quite an intensive role in the monastery but at the same time it wasn't official so from your book and from your life it's kind of mm -hmm. clear you're like an all-in person like I'm all in, I'm all into pain and I'm all into Buddhism. I'm into, and what yeah, was it that. about this, this moment, um, your encounter with Christ, how did it go and how did it attract you as an all in person? Can you talk about that? Or is it, mm. is that not what you talk about? Yeah. Um, I had been on this intensive search for healing from such a young age I had this sense like this situation I'm in this suffering that I'm in is not how it's meant to be like mm -hmm. I just always was like this isn't right something has gone wrong like life isn't supposed to be like this I know I need to take some steps in order to get free from this situation and I believe that that can happen but I didn't conceptualize it in that way I just was like I need to get free so I had been on this um, journey of healing through that had taken me, it had begun when I basically got sober, when I was um, in my early, early 20s, I started to go into recovery for addiction. And through that process, I, I, op I entered into a whole world of exploring spiritual matters, basically. But the, the, the drive was the same throughout those years. And that went on for, say, eight years. And um, but all the time I was on this looking for a release, basically, I was looking for a solution to my problems. And so when I had this encounter with Christ, everything that I had been seeking in all these different traditions, because I was I was a Buddhist, but I always also practice Hinduism. And like most Westerners who become involved with Hinduism, it's not a conscious decision. You just end up becoming Hindu because you mm. of the practices themselves of the yoga and the meditation, the chanting and goddess worship. And, um, and then also this very strong uh, focus on the elemental, the elemental traditions. And so, yeah, because everything that I'd been seeking, you know, all of the gurus and the adepts that I'd been not reading about so much, it was more like living experience, having in, uh, encounters with uh, elders from different traditions, gurus, masters, mm -hmm. maestros, everything that I had heard about that could be true, I suddenly found as being in, in Christ of he has the solution, he has the answer, he is the healer. And so it was so through the healing. So mm -hmm. there was a, there, was it a juxtaposition of that was all wrong or that was all incomplete 
or was it a combination of both? Because you're you're enlightened in the sense that you meet Christ. How did that previous world look to you in a flash? Did it did it look all wrong? Did it look like it was something that was leading you in the right direction, or was it leading you in the absolute wrong direction? That's Can a good you even question. Speak? Is it even like that? Am I, do I have that question? No, it's, it's of... a good question because it, it is kind of like that. It's like so many different levels. Um, I first, the first kind of touch with Christ did not make everything that I was doing feel bad. So the first moment came when I met my, um, my, this, my, who's now my spiritual father. And I had this meeting with him because he knew my family. And so I happened to be invited. So you would like to come meet him. And I was like, mm, well, I have a lot of questions and I have a lot of criticisms <laughs> about things that he's been saying and what he's been saying to my sister about what I'm doing. But I also knew that he'd been praying for me and I was grateful for that. And so I went out of the kind of open heartedness and I was like, yeah, well, I'll just go and see because I was open to everything. Mm. And I went and um, in that room, and I talk about this at the beginning of the book, in that room, I had this just sense of the living God and mm. that he was personal and that he loved me. And it was basically the love that then just triggered this whole process into being because I was just like, I, because in Buddhism, you don't, not really talking about love in the same way. And like, it was just so real in my heart. And I just, mm. it was so tender and touching. And I, and it was like undoing all of my, you know, defenses and this whole like power element that is there really strongly in goddess worship and in kind of sacred feminism mm. and shamanism is all about like the power and the force of the practitioner and it's quite like hardcore in that way and there's nothing about humility and vulnerability maybe it's said in an anecdotal sense but it's not there in terms of how people are going to go about their dates so it was just something so different to any all the other things i felt is something different um but that just got integrated into what I was doing because I was immersed in a lot of these other things. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a kind of block to that. I was just like, okay, great. Well, Christ can become part of my life and part of what I'm doing. Um, it was only later when I then had this moment when I then converted. So that happened in February and then the conversion took place in December that after I had that encounter, over new years then suddenly i saw what i was doing in darkness and that was the first time i'd ever experienced that because i was in this non-dual reality where there was really no darkness or if there was darkness it was like the darkness within you that you're seeing but it's not really there's no essential nature right, to the darkness, right, right, right? right. Mm -hmm. and then so then that just changed the way i was seeing things but it, again it wasn't like intellectual because i wasn't like okay now i've realized this is wrong and i'm gonna stop it it was more like i felt in myself just this like separation in me from everything and everyone that i'd been immersed in um but i had like so many so much confusion in my mind because i was like wait like these things are good my experiences them are blissful right. this is nature right. it's created by god right. it's beautiful so I had a lot of cognitive dissonance, but my spirit had just been released from the bondage it was in. So then that was the thing that pushed everything forward. And you couldn't, you couldn't deny that, that spiritual release. It was too true to you to just say, oh, it's just another type of spiritual release. It had a different quality on some level. Exactly. It was, it was so potent. Um, and I think that, for me, because I've been having a lot of very strong experiences, I'm very sensitive. So all of the spiritual kind of modalities I was involved in, they impacted me hugely. And I had a lot of visionary experiences with the plant medicines. So the what type of medicines? Plant medicines that are like um, I see. natural, mm -hmm. you know, plants that are used in a ritual context that induce mm -hmm. visions and purging. And so 
in order to kind of overwhelm that, he gave me something like a really strong dose because I think otherwise it's like I was, it was so loud. Like my sphere was so loud with all these different spirits, all these different spirit contact experiences, all these different medicines, traditions, ideas, ideologies as well. Cause I was still kind of left leaning very much and like quite forthright with that of like communist principles and um, feminist principles. So yeah, it, but what then happened, yeah, it was so potent. I couldn't deny it. And I was just like, even though everything in my mind and my heart was like, not one, not for that, it just, it just yanked me forward. In the, in the book, I, can I ask a question by telling you a quick story? Cause the story yeah. will, <clears throat> the story will really help people who are watching this and your answer will be amazingly helpful. So in the book, you talk about the spirits of the underworld. So in our work, we're in places like and I lived extensively in West Africa, Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and Mali. And in the Georgian Republic, there's an underworld tradition or an, a, a, let's just call it paganism, um, um, a type of spirit worship. That's what I want you to answer when I tell you this story. And then mm -hmm. in Haiti, living in Haiti, I actually saw this happen. There was a friend across the street from us named Ernst, and he would invite me now and then to his house. I didn't, didn't always like this guy, but anyway. And one day he came and got me and said, you got to come. There's a big party happening. And I went down the road and in, in the compound, it was, a, it was kind of a wealthy compound. Um, there were a lot of people, a hundred maybe. Mm -hmm. And they were, they had a bull. It was a pretty big animal tied to a pole. Mm -hmm. And there was a little elevated stage. And on the stage was sitting clearly a, an important woman. And her grangu, that's the word in West Africa, in the juju world, mm -hmm. um, um, was clearly he was blessing and doing things. So I'm at a, I'm at a, a, a voodoo gig, basically. Mm -hmm. And I've heard about it because we lived in, we lived there for just over a year and I, I, but I hadn't been to one and now I'm at one. And, um, the, the grungu, the priest starts to move the, the bull around and around the circle. And as he do it, he's clearly doing some sort of benedictions and prayers in, in Haitian Creole. And I'm catching some of it, but not a lot of it. And he's spitting, he's drinking liquor, he's passing a mm -hmm. bowl. And then at one point he stops and he, he directs his talk to the woman who's clearly paid him to come and do this practice. And then he takes a machete, a very sharp machete, and he slits the, the bull's throat. And then he starts to acquire the blood from the bull. The bull then is sort of tied down. It's hard to explain. It's, it's very, very violent at this point. Mm -hmm. And then he starts to collect the blood and share it with the people by putting it on them. Mm -hmm. And then it is raucous and it was pretty scary. And so mm -hmm. my question to you is, is you're in England. My guess is you're not sacrificing big animals in your pagan traditions, mm -hmm. but how does my story, which, you know, most Westerners would be like, that's just crazy people and hate crazy black people, like crazy mm -hmm. Africans, which mm -hmm. that, that happens a lot. It's dismissed as that's, were you doing something like that without the bull? <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. How does that world work vis-a-vis -vis the world you've entered now of Christ? How, did, how does that explain the theology, if you like, of the pagan world vis-a-vis -vis the world you've entered? How would you talk about that? Well, um, yeah, that's a really important point. And you also touched on something else important. So, okay. Please feel the, free to, I threw it out there to give it some meat. And then I'd love to hear how you, how you hear that story. Yeah. So uh, this is, yeah, the sort of crucial point, I think that we all need to come to understand, especially moderns. Let's not say, I mean, yeah, Westerners, but like mo people from like moderns, they have this unbelief in this, essential separation of themselves from those practices which are as you said relegated to countries that are um you know less less developed countries yeah, and they yeah. are 
um, considered to be something alien. The reason why, and in a way it's not wrong, because the reason why those things are alien to, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say white consciousness, but in a way it kind of is, um, to modern consciousness is because of Christianity, basically. Mm -hmm. So it's as a result of the fact that Christianity spread in the way that it did in the West, which is also why we have all the wonderful things that we have in the West. Those, that comes from um, Christianity, that comes from the Judeo-Christian conception of the human, especially in relation to the woman as well. Um, but if we didn't have, if that hadn't happened, we would have the exact same things in the West. So it's nothing to do with race, ethnicity. That's what we need to get really, really clear. And that's something that's not understood, not understood at all in, by, by a lot of um, Christian traditions. And that informs the faulty methodology that is used in their missionary um, kind of um, activity, basically, mm. because there's this kind of... <laughs> othering and also belief that they're in the eurocentric christianity and the thing that derived from it there is like that there's an essential um that there's that they're associating with something essential essential to them as white people as opposed to the fact that this is just from christianity it's actually got nothing to do with you being european does that make sense it, yeah the civilization called europe doesn't exist apart from the religion that they've already adopted. So I know mm -hmm. what you mean. There's a sense by many Europeans, and I mean Americans, I call them light people, people of the enlightenment. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. on this yeah, podcast. Yeah, that's accurate, yeah. Yeah, the light people, I think, and Tom Holland talks about this, have divorced themselves. They imagine their civilization is existing separate from the the God that they've imbibed, the God called Christ. But you're saying on some level, right? If I got this, there's no they go together. That's one reason why we have a Western civilization is because it is fundamentally, at some level, Christic. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Yes, um, and that's a good thing. Like what Christ bought for us on the cross. And this is really what this is really important topic for our generation because because we're divorced from because it's sort of in the so far in the past it's like none of this is remembered so therefore you can just you know roast into glasses about what pagan and paganism is and what it does and what life inside that is like and that's what the whole neo pagan pagan movement is showing you know it's all about the flowers and it's all about the tinctures and the herbs and all of those things and the harvest festival and you know the sunset but this is like the advertising for paganism the reality of paganism is so violent is so dark is so destructive especially to women and obviously to children as well so because that is what that's so the whole script all of the scriptures are demonstrating that that's why mm. yahweh from you know from book to book is talking about driving out the practices of the canaanites and the Hivites, and that, like it, it's like he's showing that these are all the ways that these this this result is the you know the result of the fall and these are destructive to the human and they these keep you separated from me as God. So you can't have healing. You can't have goodness. You can only have the um, transaction, as you said before, of pagan spirituality. It's all about you mm. give, you receive. It's like, it's not about love. It's not about <laughs> mercy and forgiveness and all of the things that we now take as a given. And, and I'm kind of, let's go back to your main point because I've, I've kind of gone on like a trail but oh it's wonderful though it's wonderful. <laughs> but the um this is something I see so much in my generation and I want to just explore this with everyone is to see like and this is something I experienced in my own life as a pagan worshiper who was in the new age it's like i projected i found this out after when i became christian i had projected onto these spirits that i worshipped all of the qualities of christ because those qualities of christ have been disseminated through christianity and then and associated correctly with god because that's who the true god is yahweh that's who god is 
um, but then have come to be seen as like these free qualities that can be attributed to any God and any situation. And you, with the power of your mind, can choose what you do and who you give it to. And you're in control. But the reality is you're not in control. You think you're in control because all of the I, or the dogmas of the new age, you know, are talking about self-realization and self-understanding and working on yourself and being the master. But really, for the pagan spirits, like, if you are aware of how they work or if you're not it doesn't really matter to them if they if you think i'm in control i'm the master i'm just this is my little pet spirit guide who i'm you know calling in and he's going to do what i want the spirit doesn't care that you're not giving him due respect in with your mind so long as he's able to work through you or she's able to work through you and do what she wants through you it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how that comes into being so we have this misguided sense of our own um what's the word not authority like sovereignty in our mm -hmm. spiritual mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. um and the dogmas of the new age and it's common everywhere you see it all over instagram all over the internet now of like you know being the master and you do you and you're in control and all these things manifest the life you want to live and empowerment all feed into that how do you how do you you talk also in the book about the spirit of the age it feels like you did a beautiful job right there of describing it of something like i get to activate my own happiness or something is that how would you describe the spirit of that this age hmm. um yeah everything ultimately goes back to the self you are the master you are the creator you are the person who is driving your life um so there's that in terms of this the theological element that there is no living god with a personhood with a personality even with a mind with thoughts if there is god it's you know the god within and it's mostly though not even personal it's like the force and you channel the force of mm. the universe which is on your side always um and there's no i'd say so the so the so the main things is it's a good question i'd actually like to sit down and kind of systematically codify it and actually another book i'm working on is kind of doing that but um there's no um you decide basically what's right and yeah. wrong you decide yeah. what's good and bad there's no outside precepts or statutes or commandments there's nothing from that exists beyond your own reality that would say what is and isn't right and wrong and you should obey that and just mm -hmm. the, the whole notion of obedience is so alien so, so, so alien. alien so i oppressive that that's helpful um because the paganism, again, whatever it is, the spirit of many of the countries we work in, even the Georgian Republic, I see there's there's very ancient old altars to the pre-Christian gods. You can find them in Georgia. Mm. The thing that you're describing in the book that I recognized and that our guys recognize in the field is the transactional nature of pagan worship. It's, mm. it's, I'll give you this, you give me this. And to me, now, I don't know what you think about this, if you want to get in hot water, but to me, the pagan spirituality wreck, it resembles modern capitalist market morality, which is, it's transactional. The reason I'm giving you this is so that you'll give me that. And the entire premise of the relationship of a merchant to a merchant is it's not about what's good or right. It's about what I can get back from you. And I find that that is really pagan in nature. In other words, mm -hmm. it, that system will work well with a new age to come. Um, and I wonder if that's something we're talking about. I don't know that you want, I know there's so many good things in your book. You just made me think of that. And I, I think so many Christians in the modern world and the Protestant Christians have come to peace 
with market morality, but it makes me nervous. Mm, that's good. It should make me nervous because it's antithetical to the the spirit of worship, the spirit of the fathers, the spirit of the saints, the of Christ Himself. So, yeah, I mean, just to say one like something from my experience that speaks to that specifically, like one of the things that sort of contributed to my conversion was the fact that um, when I went out to the monastery, I was, I didn't have to pay anything to stay there, which was like, <laughs> oh, wow, like that's unusual. Um, and not only that, but that the, the, the spiritual mother had wanted to pay for me for my flight in order so that I could come. So she was, and I was like, that's just unheard of in the world that I was in. And uh, another thing, for example, once I was in the monastery, having a sit down session with her in which we would talk about my spiritual process was something that, um, you know, just was given freely. Whereas if in the work that I was doing, um, facilitating retreats and spending time with, you know, like working for healers, uh, pagan healers, I would, you know, you'd put in place their session with the person, the person who's coming and paying to have the healing ritual overnight. And then if they were to have a one-on-one, -on -one, then that would be something that was also quantified and paid for. Or if they were to have a healing, you know, you do the healing and then it's like, okay, now give me the money. And it's a lot of money. It's not like cheap. <laughs> <It> was, yeah. <laughs> So I was like, so that element for me, I don't think it's, I don't think that's a left field point at all. I feel like it's completely central. And that's, that's why, you know, all the liturgical, um, what the hymns and everything the church talk about, you know, the free given gift and right, right, giving right. for free. And we, we should actually really um, hone in on this and put the spotlight on this because it will help people to understand, to question, you know, what they're doing and these things that they think to be spirituality of the yoga classes and the meditation and all these things you sign up for and the packages and everything, coaching, because like you, God, the gift he gives us is something that we can't ever repay. And really the love that you experience when you come into contact with it, like, well, it would like undo you you're wanting them to repent it's like a whole different dynamic yeah you know in that story i i told about the bull um that woman as it turned out I, I it was a fascinating day and i went to try to find out what was going on and i kind of knew the woman had paid the the priest to come and call down erzuli which is the god, the goddess of love, in in that tradition in the in, in Haiti, and was asking Erzuli to help her get her husband back, mm. and that felt like other situations I'd been in in West Africa and other places. That's that transactional approach, and um, yeah. it's. I just am so interested how that ties into your your previous life as a civilized Brit doing civilized juju. I, I always find that very interesting, you know, but mm. I don't well, know. So my world was completely global. I mean, that was the, all the things I was doing in the, the retreat that I sent up, I, I set up this like um, cycle of retreats called wild women, which was for women only. And it was like a trauma healing retreat for women through nature to, celebrate and heal, purify with the elements, recuperating the lost traditions of England, Wales and, um, and Scotland. Basically like, let's get back to our pre-Christian past I where see, we will I find see. real freedom. Um, so that was something that was like the fruit of the work that I had been doing across the years before that. But I was all over the world going to lots of different countries. So I was learning yeah. from traditions that were more, uh, rooted and had not yet basically come into contact it hadn't been eradicated by christianity the thing is this is it, it kind of hurts my heart like this subject because 
my it's yeah it's just I can't sort of believe in a way that I'm an orthodox Christian talking about this because I was like so against that the, the, the eradication of these indigenous traditions through Christian missionary activity um and I wasn't there was things I was thinking that was still that still stand and still correct and I talk about this in the book especially in relation to First Nation and Native American peoples um in terms of that the the wipeout that took place of the cultures as a result of spiritual practices that contradict Christ and then the enforcement of European or U practices that are actually cultural and not spiritual yes, and the conflation right. Right. of right. these two things which created all this you know taking away the languages and stuff like this like this is such an awful awful thing that happened in America but so I want to in time I hope I will be able to help support like schools and situations uh you know incentives in order to help um you know foster the learning of these beautiful god-given languages because it says so clearly in revelation god had his mind for all the nations you know they all come with the palm branches and they are all in their unique divinely so ordained beautiful. image and God mm -hmm. made them like that for a reason. That's not not everyone's supposed to be European. But the point is, everyone is supposed to know the true God, and we know the true God through Christ. How that that like how that knowing Him and experiencing Him and living the revelation of God occurs from culture to culture, changes from culture to culture, and also should. And this is something that I'm particularly in, like I guess invested in is that the information comes through the elders, and I think this is chimes with the work that you do with First Link Foundation. It comes through the elders, it comes through these organic structures that are already in place. It's not about this like violence and this force. And Saint Sophroni talks about this a lot. And a lot of uh yeah, which orthodoxy has this amazing inheritance of that. And you know, as you said, Saint Hamlet Velasco, Saint Innocent, the the orthodox approach to missionary work is something that involves the assimilation, the respect, the again, patience, the repentance, patience, the patience, yeah, and also yeah. the res uh, uh, and also, um, you know, I, I have know a wonderful person who did a lot of work in Alaska and um, a, 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 an Orthodox priest. But for a lot of these cultures, when they come to know Christ through orthodoxy, they see, oh, we don't have to get rid of all of our saints, you know, or our our ancestors and our, because it's like those who are working for good and who are supporting life on earth and su supporting the community these are the, the saints of those traditions so then they can become integrated into their church not so, in a secretive way not in terms of mixing witchcraft and christianity i'm not saying that but in terms of um the sanctification of these things from within which is what orthodoxy does so it has to come from within it has to be the internal and then it, and it's not a transformation that is a separation from that original identity it's something that uh is bringing it to its original image which is the place where the freedom is which is what happened to the greeks some of the first christians which is mm -hmm. what happened to the first jews who became christians the first russians Mm -hmm. it's, it's so funny what eugenics has done for us in the way we think about race and civilization. It, the eugenics story in us as Westerners, which we now call racism or whatever, is so profoundly powerful and destructive because you're just describing what happened to all the white people, <laughs> which is not an abandonment of what they were, but a fulfillment of what was already happening, right? The, mm -hmm. the bringing of the most beautiful things into perfection mm -hmm. it, it can happen anywhere that it's not a white black southern northern geographical thing and i love mm -hmm. that you say that at the same point you can't you can't keep a worship of a demonic spirit as the orthodox tradition that's not what we do right would you right. agree with that yeah of course we can't I mean, do that th <laughs> this is yeah, I mean, that, and that's exactly where syncretism gets to the end of it. You know, that's where it comes to the end of the road. And it's like, okay, there comes a point where you do have to, and that's what covenant is. That's what the whole Old Testament is like. The, like, the 
covenant, the Hebrew word for covenant is both the joining together as well as the cutting off. There needs to be the cut off. And that's something that if you were in that situation, as for example, I found myself in when I converted and I had to cut off, which I did from my whole life, all of my relationships, all of my friends, social world, work world, everything, my relationship is you do that willingly because you know that these things are taking away from life and that you have more life if you cut off from them. So it's not like, and I think that's something that something else that comes up in the conversation a lot about um, un understandable, like understandable about Christian missionary work, but there is this kind of, and that I un so I understand why there were these things said because for the reason I just explained, I also thought these things, and it's true there has been a lot of misguided activity. But actually, as I go deeper and deeper into Christ, I also start to look back at some of these things. I'm like, but maybe you know, it's also not as black and white as I thought in terms of those missionaries because they're also if they if they have authority in the spirit, they're going to be releasing those groups from from place to place, and those groups are not going to be unhappy about that fact, however much they then. I don't know, put on a dress, for example. Right, right. But right. Um, I'm not I'm not saying, I'm not supporting that, and I'm not saying that's the right way to do it, and that's not how it works nowadays, across a lot of different Christian traditions as well. It's not just orthodoxy. They have wised up and grown up and matured a lot in terms of their methodology. Um, but there is this kind of, um, it's, it's so contradictory, because on the one hand, you're saying these indigenous traditions have... Um, you know, knowledge that is beyond Christian understanding, wisdom that is beyond understanding. So you can't go and you can't Christianize these cultures. Then at the same time saying these poor indigenous people, they're being manipulated, they're being coerced into Christianity. They have no understanding of what's happening. They're victims. And it's like, this is so patronizing <laughs> to the indigenous. Yeah, Why do so you passionate. think that they don't have the ability to discern what is and isn't true for themselves, that they don't have the ability to hear the gospel. Maybe they're not necessarily reading it in their, in their native language, but to say like, oh yeah, this explains all these spiritual right. questions I've right. had and understanding right. I've had. So that's an issue that's taking place in mind. This is, uh, I could keep going. Where we hit something, I don't know. There's some commonality from your experience. Mm -hmm. England with my experience in these countries that, oh, I could talk about this all day. Here, mm -hmm. Here's another thing. He, healing. So your book is, it goes pretty deeply into this idea. And look at you. I mean, you've been transformed. You did not do a transaction. You know, you just, mm. you didn't trade something. You got, trans, you're, you're in a habit. You're sitting here talking to me as a nun. Um, but there's something that happened to you that's healing. And I, I really love what you said is, Every human being can recognize when they're getting healthy, like it's, but we mm. get upside down and we get sideways. So how did healing look to you in the end? What did, what did the healing, how would you describe the actual healing process? The healing process in following my conversion or in the lead up to it? And on maybe, it. maybe it's probably a two part question, which is what did the suffering look like? And then how did you know, like, oh, my gosh, this is the medicine. Oh, 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 this is the medicine. Did, did you have a moment like that? Mm. Yeah. Um, well, the suffering was complicated and um, multifaceted. And I won't, like, explain everything because people, when they can read, they'll be able to read it better than what I could probably say. Sure, sure. Um, get the book, guys. Get the book. <laughs> but I, it's like this void, you know, inside this hunger, unconscious at the start, just like a sense of such overwhelming emptiness that needed to be filled. And it's like this vacuum that sucked in different things to fill it. And one thing was not enough because the void was so vast. And so it became composite um, addictions, composite behaviors. Life was chaotic and out of control. And I was spinning, drawing these things inside myself to try and basically fill up the gap and 
numb um, the pain. And I think a lot of people can relate to that. And the addictions can manifest in a lot of ways, whether it could be substance, because how, whether it's like substances or process addictions or that, and how those things figure whether it's alcohol, or drugs, or tobacco, or food, it's going to change slightly from like based on your trauma, based on your personality type, based on your somatic makeup. But essentially, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to neutralize what's inside. Mm -hmm. And so that was this thing that was like the engine that was driving me forward first in my quest for liberation in the world and then in my um, more conscious quest for freedom once I started to get clean and started to heal and I was confused about this for a long time uh, following my conversion so I was like but okay so everything outside of Christ is not real healing he's the only healer you know all those traditions they don't heal but I was like but I I know I healed like across those years from the age of 21 to 28, for example, when I got sober, like I changed so much. My life changed so much. And as, as I, and it kind of concludes with this at the end of the book, but like I realized that, yeah, because the Holy spirit had been working in me mm. from across those years, anonymously in his humility, um, trying to counteract all of the negative things I was doing through these other practices that I thought were healing. But he had, there was no way I was going to become Christian, uh, become Christian. I was like a militant feminist, left wing, super against the church and like very, very kind of like intellectually focused, ideological, like the idea of the church and Christ was just like, no way. That's not my aunt. That's not, and I came from a Christian background as well. So like I was like, yeah, I was in the church and it didn't help me. It didn't help me give me things I needed. So now I need to look elsewhere. Um, so like a lot of people, a lot of women, um, God in his compassion and his immense humility just said like, okay, let, let me lead you into nature, which is, you know, the physical revelation of a huge part of my heart and the beauty of nature which reflects so much the beauty of me and 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 it was through going into nature and starting to purify from the circular world that then i did then then things started to change in me and my life started to change and obviously that was a huge because of getting sober um but the sobriety is something that was in stages because although i wasn't drunk on alcohol or drugs uh, I was not sober mentally, emotionally at all. And then also I started to get involved in a lot of these practices, which are very hedonistic and they are, they don't, you know, they don't, um, they, they affect your mind and the way you like cognize basically. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. but as I, yeah, so that was something that I sort of came to understand that, he, the Holy Spirit, because, you know, we, we talk a lot and it's very easy once you convert and you think like everything outside, like that must, you have to put it really black and white and, and you feel like you're being disobedient if you don't do that. But actually God is sovereign over all of our lives and he is everywhere and fills all things, as we say uh, in the liturgy. So it's like he it's just a case of when he's bringing you, preparing you for that moment because he's so gentle, he won't force on you. So he's just yes, like yeah, constantly yeah, like right. coaxing you, trying to get you to a place where he could just give you one message and you can receive it. So that was how I then started to understand my life before Christ and my life in Christ. However, very important to clarify that I, once you start to have the healing of Christ, which is the healing of your soul, you realize that these other things I was doing were not healing my soul. They were, they were soulish and they appeared to be doing that because it was all in the spirit world, but it wasn't spirituality. It wasn't relationship with the actual living spirit. And that's something completely different. And once you experience it, 
then you'll realize that these other things were not the same thing. But until yeah. you do, you can look at it from the outside and you'll think, yeah, exactly. I'm doing that. That's what I'm doing in my pagan tradition. That's how right. synthetism in the new age works. Yeah. Sorry, what well, was the second a, part of the question? No, no, that I, <laughs> I was, I was just going to keep going with that, but okay, yeah, let's keep I going. was, well, I was the question basically, and I think you really touched on it though, was what, what was the suffering like for a modern woman that, that led you to seek? And then you talked about that and then, mm. and then how did the healing, you know, describe the healing? And I think you did. I mean, for me, the takeaway from your book, and it's really, guys, it's really, the concepts in it are really, I think, profoundly relevant. That's, that's mm. what I would say, sister. Um, so many people, at least in our world, the restaurant and the people we recruit, the people, they all have what you, what you have talked about and also in the book, which is there's some kind of hole. Like, why is this hole? What's this hole about? And um, that hole, is, I think, is what you're describing as the suffering and the healing is well, it has been Christ for you. How do you, how do you, well, you wrote a whole book about it, but how do you speak now to people who can't see what you're talking about? There must be, there must be a bridge that people have to approach before you can really make sense of you in a habit. How do you suggest to all of us to speak to folks who may be in that place of, of pain that you were in what's the best way to approach such mm. such people well i can i guess going from what i experienced myself i was never told at any point from the first meeting with my spiritual father who then became my spiritual father to my journey out to the monastery and meeting all the nuns and seeing my sister and the spiritual mother of the monastery and all of the Christian community, Orthodox community that they, uh, that sort of surrounded the monastery um, and my parents who are both Christian always were. I never was told once that what I was doing was wrong or that I needed to um, change. I'm not saying although they also didn't beforehand, but I'm saying in this specific journey of transformation, no one said anything. It was all through um, the power of, of the Holy Spirit talking to me through their witness, their example. And what I did um, and what I would, and this is because I've had this question asked me before, like, what would you do, for example, with a feminism, uh, with a feminist who's really immersed in this worldview and is against all these things? I wouldn't approach them and try and, you know, on the intellectual, like, argue them down. And that's something that about, like, some Christian apologetics that I always found just, like, kind of mystifying, like, you know, like the street preacher who's like, okay, so you think this, or like, what about this? And they see all these things and people are just like dumbfounded and just like, oh yeah. <laughs> like, I think that that does work for some people, but I was always like, even if they like convince me on an intellectual level, I, was told, I would still, me prior to my conversion, I would just be like, yeah, but that's just intellectual. Like on the spiritual level, there's this happening right. on the spiritual level. Right. So like, it has to work <clears throat> on, on the different levels. So the thing that I would do is I would just invite, and I do, this is, this is an invitation to everyone to come and to just experience the life. Just come and don't, not necessarily you need to come and change. Just, just come. Like, why don't you, what, like, what have you got to lose? Okay. You're doing all these things. You're spending all this money on therapy, on healing modalities, which are becoming more and more commonplace. And obviously they never fully left, but, it's become so normal to practice witchcraft and sorcery in our culture. It's just every day. And you're trying so hard. You're working out so much. You're dieting so much, intermittent fasting, and all of these things that you're doing in order to try and find freedom. You're killing yourself with your career. You're constantly grinding. You're, and it's like, what? It's not working. Like, obviously, you are... <laughs> That's right you're still in pain. Like when you get home and you close the door and you stand in front of the mirror and you look at yourself, when you can put aside the thoughts of, you know, um, okay, about how you look and what you want to change about how you look or like 
the narcissistic cycle, thought cycles of how great you look and then this, this group of people who you were just with were admiring your body or your clothes or whatever it is that at that time is the thing that's making giving you that dopamine hit look at yourself and the reality is it's like you can't accept yourself you don't love yourself you you can't allow yourself to be loved and so like come and just maybe like okay I'm going to just try and open myself I'm not going to change anything about myself there's no expectation of you doing that but just come I'm saying come and visit the monastery we'll see it's very busy but there might be space but there's many monasteries uh, many churches and just watch what people are doing and do it don't ch don't worry about your mind and don't you have to don't, you don't have to change what you think at all just come and do it do it with your body prostrate and wow. read these words and listen to this music and see what happens because for me there's so many paths to christ and i think that's what's so beautiful about the orthodox confession of faith the christian confession of faith that there is so many ways for me i didn't actually come to christ through christ i came through asceticism because i was in these different traditions and i was seeking purity i was already fasting uh, and going into the wilderness and having these long periods and i was trying to that's that was the, the mode and also because i knew it was working i was like this is how i get free when i came to the monastery i was suddenly met these christian ascetics and i was like you're doing what i want to do but you're doing it both externally and internally in a way that none of these traditions that i'm wow. doing that i'm in are actually reaching that deep inside it's like you're more hardcore and it was through that that I was convinced, like, that I was convinced, like this is the truth. Because I was like, well, if you if you're more aesthetic than these other traditions, like you must have some other higher form of knowledge. Mm. Wow, sister, this is, yeah. What do we, what do we do with someone who, in the modern world, came to orthodoxy through asceticism? That's a unique path that in our country. I say obesity to not really represent just the body, but the way we live is always excess. Mm -hmm. Most people are waking up from a type of obesity, but you had already been pushed into a type of asceticism that led to maybe the true asceticism that, mm -hmm. that nourishes also the soul. So that's an unusual path. I think, I think you have mm -hmm. a lot to say sister. And I, I'm, I think we said a lot of it. So Here's one last question. Mm. And I don't, forgive me, we don't have to, we can try this. But you were a Christian before you were not, and then now you are. But can we lay some blame at the foot of something like a Western Christianity? Is that, does that figure into your narrative? Because a lot of people are Christians running around. I mean, I'm going to go to the restaurant tonight and meet a bunch of Christians that they're not Orthodox. How do you square that? What, what do you say about the Christianities, so to speak out there? Are they like better than not? Do you, do you go like, yeah, it's like, you know, it's better to eat this than that, but this is way better. Like how, how do you, how do you square it? Well, in the, in this journey, I definitely did um, lay a lot of blame at the feet of the Western church in terms of my um, experience and what the way things had been and why I left the church. I was 12, sort of unofficial. Hmm. Um, but, and there's no point denying the reality that a lot of the Christian witness in Western traditions has been really, really um, diluted, become the spirit of the world entered. And, you know, the, what people associate with, especially in England, with Christianity is like so comical, you know, like the Vicar of Dibley and Tarts and Bishops parties and church fates selling cakes and, you know the queen's speech and like it's just it's just part of like the furniture it's a little bit funny it's a little bit it's nothing serious and it's definitely nothing that will impact your stop you from doing what you want to do it's just part of like our culture this is true obviously because a lot of countries 
um, but I'm British, so just thinking in, in terms of that. But as I go on, and I, and I did, I did think that a lot at the beginning, but then I also, I feel like God started to, well, one, like my path was the way it was because it was his plan. Like I had to, right, right. you know, so I can't, I, I can't even think in that way anymore because it's like I, everything, it's not that everything ha was meant to happen because God is good. There's no darkness in him at all. So he, there isn't going to be bad things coming from him, but the economies of the different situations of every human being in terms of your ancestral lineage, all of the background that's coming, the cultural background, the, the, the things that happen across your early life that all have consequences. Everything has consequences. So all of these things are going to have to play out and that informs your path towards or away from God. So especially, and the ancestry is super uh, important. And that was something that's very strong in my own story. I have come from a background where there had been a lot of demonic worship. So it, the, the consequences of that manifested very strongly in my life in terms of addiction, in terms of the things that have been happening and that that's explained in the book. So it's like those God is merciful, but he is also righteous. And so the holy laws that are there and laid out in the scriptures still stand. I mean, still stand now. And this is something for our generation because it seems like a kind of affectation from the past. We don't take the Bible seriously as something that's actually real and living. It's just, it's, it's, we're so post, 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 post modern in terms of our relationship with Christianity, the church and the Bible. It's like, there's so many layers of blockage that need to be sloughed away through the work of Christ in us before we can really like start to have that really immediate relationship again with them, which we need to have because it's the source of life. Um, but so, so yeah, I, there's no denying though that there was lack in terms of a witness to holiness which is what I saw when I then met my spiritual father and I, I, I met my uh, came to the monastery and I also the the practice of orthodoxy the process the intensity of the prayers the the, the you know it wasn't just something that happened in your mind and that's something that has I think we can all agree happen in in western theology is that 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 separation and it's there isn't the um the, the the holy meeting between yeah. the theology yeah. and the practical element of it the mystical the, yeah the mystical basically and i was all about the mystical that's what led me into into the relationship with christ but i i'm i'm so careful also not to because i think that's something i really i don't like laziness and i don't like lazy thinking and i feel like also as orthodox it, we we don't want to get into you know make it like kind of like well we're orthodox and everyone else is not we're right they're wrong so then we can just put up our feet and like not worry about anything because that's there's no scriptural basis for that it's all about what are you doing now in terms of your heart with god and so we want to always stay in this place of of intense like contrition and humility and you know there is a lot of witnesses to um real living life in Christ right. across right. those other Christian traditions. And, and what I've noticed since becoming Orthodox um, and, and the times that I've been back to England, but also suddenly realizing like, wait, that Christian life in England is living like that. that it, there's all this stuff going on. I had no idea. I saw churches all over London because they're all over London, but I never considered that people actually went into them, you know, in a serious way. So even this whole idea of like, it's died out, like it's sort of started to be questioned as well, because I'm seeing that, that it, it, there is a lot of thriving life, but of course there are these theological differences and those are, these are serious differences. And, and I think that's what's, I think that's understood. And we're talking about that. And I don't, I don't believe in like a superficial unity because you know it's always about the word right, of unity. Right. We want it to be no, like you said, in, yeah. <laughs> to, no, to come forgive me. From, I don't, keep no, keep going, keep going. I no, I was just say don't. It, it it's got to come through sanctification, not through just like we wanna, we want, we want to be connected, but like it has to come through. We are unified because we have returned to a place of unity within ourselves and within God. And we, we connect through God rather than um, on maybe like a lesser, more like cultural level. But 
that's a big other discussion. Maybe we could talk about it another time. But yeah. um, well, I, I think we, well, first of all, yeah. I'd like to say about all this, you know what I've seen in this conversation? I wonder what people would say and um, see what their comments are. But you've done an amazing job of, of describing the paradox. And I think in our tradition, where there's paradox, you're probably over the target of truth. It shouldn't be real easy just to A, mm. B, C, the truth. And, and I've noticed so through true. all of your conversation, you've done such a beautiful job of saying it's this and this. And, mm. and I think it really confuses the light people that it's both. But whenever I hear one of our guests or someone I'm, I'm working with describe truth in this paradoxical way, a miraculous way where it's true and yet somehow I can't conceive it, I love those people. Mm -hmm. They make, you know, in my own life, my brother, sister, and I, we were taught the foundations of orthodoxy by heretical mother and father, <laughs> the Episcopalians. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. you're going to go, they're not heretics. Well, I don't know. We can have a whole nother podcast on that, but I'll tell you mm -hmm. what they weren't. They weren't orthodox. And yet mm -hmm. they prepared us for this. So what's that about? Like, how does that work? You know what I mean? Like... And right there, I think we're safe to say we're probably hovering over something beautiful. We should probably be thankful. I, I hear that in your conversation. I don't mm. know. It's been so. It's been beautiful. Will you come back sometime? And we also, when you come back, update us on how the how the book is going. Is this? Are you a first time author in terms of public guys at Saint Vladimir's Press? And we'll have we'll have um, links to it in our in our show notes. Thank and stuff. you. Yeah. Uh, yes, sure. I am a first time first time author. Are you happy? Is, is it so far? Is it is it like a lot of monastics I know are like, oh boy, I don't want to deal with this. Like, are you okay? It's starting to happen where people want to reach out to you. Yes, because this is what God put in place for me to do, and I'm, my life is dedicated to doing what is right for Him. So of course, and I don't. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how. How it works and and unfolds but so long as i can try and be as clear and helpful um as possible in in talking about christ because it's through christ that everything comes he's the you know enlightener but also obviously but he's like <laughs> the intellect you know he does everything he has all the answers to intellectual questions he, he is the one who will make your mind supple and do all these things so it's like I want to just show people and they, like have the relationship with him because everything I know and everything I say it all just came through having relationship and worship with Christ. Well, in the books, you are mine, which is a nice way to stop right there because you just described that. Yeah, you're like mm -hmm. that's all I know. Mm -hmm. um, okay, will you be a friend of First Things and of me, and I'll try to make it out to the monastery. My wife and I often go to the Greek monasteries, mm. um, but we'll come find you. Please do. One day, it would be a blessing. <laughs> you don't yes. understand. My wife is a total monastery file. Like, That's I'm great. not so. I'm not so good, sister. Don't be mad at me. I try my best, but it's uh, okay. Uh, step by step. That's step by step. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you for everything. Uh, what a great conversation. I appreciate yes. it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I don't know. Sister Anastasia is coming back. Like she's some sort of like, like famous person. She is famous, but I don't, it's weird. She's a nun, but it's not weird. What's weird is the modern world. There's a new kind of access to everything, which is daunting, right? But Sister Anastasia found herself in a monastery in order to find her freedom. Man, most days that looks pretty good. Except if you're like me and you're... <sighs> gotta watch out what you're indebted to in this world. But... Many good things. Guys, become a monthly donor. I know a lot of you are like, I'm going to do that. But actually do it. Please. $5, $10, $25. Some of you could do 100 Yeah, you could. You could. What will happen is, is the payback will be so profound because it is a properly, properly directed offering. 
because we're just this bootstrapping characters out there writing incredible heroic stories about really about local people who are amazing they take us in and then we offer something to them it's just it's cool man first things foundation www.first-things.org please consider supporting our our field workers that's what that donation goes to when you're monthly it goes to getting them something to eat maybe some bush meat in Sierra Leone where you're not really sure what the food is you're like that's a meat mm which kind and they go bush meat you know that's not helpful which kind of but am i eating a monkey sometimes you are and now everyone went oh my god yeah it's not that big of a deal as long as it's cooked <laughs> that's a different problem guys why am i telling you this donate www.first-things.org see you soon this is heavy things lightly by first things foundation peace out